What's up my producer friends, I'm David with anothermonsterproductions.com. In this video I'm going to show you some things that I do within my workflow to help me get the best possible mix that I can. So last week I was doing a lot of private lessons and one issue that a lot of people were struggling with is mixing and specifically they were struggling with how to incorporate mixing into their workflow so that they don't have a ton of extra work when they actually get to the mixing process. So this is something that I used to struggle with a lot when I first started producing and over the years I've kind of come up with a way to implement mixing into my workflow so that I can get the best possible results and so that I can expedite the mixing process and just mix as quickly as possible and get the best possible results. So that's what I'm going to be talking about in today's video. Let's get straight into it. All right, so I just want to kind of preface this tutorial by saying that this is my process. When it comes to music production and specifically workflow and mixing, which is pretty much the topic of this video, there's not necessarily a right or wrong way to do this. So I don't want this tutorial to come across as if this is the only way that you should do it. This is just my way, it works for me, and I wanna share it with you guys just in case you're struggling with this and you maybe wanna sort of tweak your workflow to be a little bit more like this. So when it comes to mixing and when it comes to workflow in general, the goal is that we wanna spend the least amount of time producing. We don't want to have to do any sort of backtracking and spend tons of extra time doing extra work when we could have just solved this issue from the beginning in our workflow process. So the biggest mixing mistake that I commonly see is that producers won't turn the levels of everything down quite enough to begin with. And as a result, as you start stacking more and more sounds on top of each other, all the sounds combined are actually clipping or going above zero decibels. Now clipping is something that you just want to be careful of. There are instances where you can clip something for an effect and it's actually something you want to do. But generally speaking, we don't want all of our instruments to be peaking above zero decibels if we're not intending for a specific effect. And the reason for this is it causes distortion. Now there are certain sounds like kicks, for example, uh, a lot of drum sounds actually sound better with distortion on them. It's not always the case, but sometimes they do. But other instruments like pianos, for example, are gonna sound absolutely terrible if you clip them or add distortion on them. So this is the biggest issue that I wanna address in this tutorial. It's what I'm gonna be talking about. And what I wanna do is just kind of show you my process of how I would go about making a beat from scratch and sort of mixing it as I go so that when I actually do get to the mixing process, I have very little work left to do. So let's go ahead and get straight into that. Now there actually is one more thing that I wanna briefly mention. This is something I've been telling a lot of my students throughout the week, and that is that as I mentioned earlier, the goal of workflow is to create a pattern for yourself that saves you time so that when you're in the studio, you're not having to backtrack, you're not having to spend extra time working on little things. And a good starting place with this is to create your own custom templates because that's going to give you sort of a, a, a starting point where you've already saved maybe 10, 15 minutes of loading up various plugins, sounds, whatever the case may be. For example, I know that on my master channel, I like to have Ulean Loudness Meter as a metering plugin that I can reference and also span. And what I was doing for a long time is I would load up a blank template and then I would have to add these plugins onto the master channel every time. And it only takes a couple minutes to do that, but those minutes add up over time. So if you create a template for yourself, go ahead and have these plugins loaded up. It's gonna save you a lot of time. And you can go way deeper than just having a couple plugins loaded up. As you can see on my mixer here, I have a bunch of instruments as sort of a starting point, some drums, various things, uh, just basic stuff, but at least I have something there. And if I decide to use these samples, they're already loaded up. I don't have to worry about any rooting or anything like that. So that's step number one. Go ahead and create a custom template for yourself. If you guys don't know how to do that, I'll go ahead and leave a link in the description of this video as well as on the screen right now to a video I made forever ago, which will show you how to do that. Okay, cool. So I'm not gonna make an entire beat here, uh, but I'm gonna show you kind of what I do. And if you've been following the channel, you've probably kind of seen me do this before anyway, but it's not really something that I necessarily mention or highlight. So that's what I'm gonna do in this video. So first things first, let's say I start with an instrument. I'm gonna use IOTA Mini because it's a great free plugin that you guys can use. We'll find just a random bell preset. And now you guys may have noticed, uh, I actually, on my master channel, I have a Maximus, which is essentially a mastering plugin, uh, but what this is doing is multiband compression and then also maximizing slash limiting. I'm basically boosting the frequencies to make everything louder. So a lot of times what I do while I'm mixing is I switch in between muting this and leaving it on to give myself a good idea of what the mix is gonna sound like. Once it's actually pushed with limiting 
compression, various other things to a commercial level. And one main reason I do this is because as things get pushed up louder, uh, it kind of affects the overall balance of the mix. For example, the sub bass is gonna sound way heavier, way louder, way bigger when things are pushed up louder. Uh, so it's really easy when you're mixing with plenty of headroom to want to mix your bass too loud. And doing this trick will kind of help to make sure you're not doing that. Just get a better sense of what it's gonna actually sound like when it's finished. So this is a slightly unorthodox approach, but again, this is just kind of how I've been doing things uh, for a little while and it's been working for me. Okay, so now back to our instrument, IOTA Mini. Uh, we have a bell. Now the first thing that I'm gonna do is I'm gonna turn this down um, to probably about 25%. <laughs> So now if I were to take Maximus off, I mean, you can see how low this instrument is peaking. It's peaking at about negative 24, negative 25 decibels. So I'm leaving tons of headroom. So by the time I add drums and all the other instruments and everything in this project, I'm probably gonna be peaking at anywhere from negative 12 to negative six decibels. Now I've been taking kind of a conservative approach and leaving tons of extra headroom because one thing that I've noticed is it's a, it's a lot easier to turn things up than it is to turn things down once you actually get to the mixing stage. Okay, so the next thing that I'm gonna do is after I've loaded up my instrument, I've turned the volume down, I'm gonna go ahead and route it to a free mixer track. Uh, you can do it the way that I just did it or you can use this little button here and you can go ahead and assign a free mixer track using that number there. It's gonna to link to whichever track is here. Now, the reason I do it that way by rooting it to the free mixer track as opposed to using this number thing is because it automatically assigns it the same name as whatever this is. And so that way I can keep track of what's actually going on in the mixer a little bit easier. Now, ideally you incorporate into your workflow a little bit of extra time to actually go in here and potentially rename and color it and match everything up properly with what you have going on in your playlist and stuff like that. Organization is another really big thing that I struggle with a lot. Uh, I've definitely been getting a lot better at it, but I'm not perfect. But if you can go ahead and get into the habit of just labeling things as you go, it's gonna ultimately save you a lot of headache later if you need to open up your project six months from now and you completely forgot you know, where everything is, nothing's labeled, it's a big headache. Believe me, I've had to deal with that before. So now that you've got your instrument loaded into the mixer, I'm gonna go ahead and start adding a couple little things on it, maybe some bad tape, uh, but basically what my goal with this is, I'm just gonna go ahead and process this and do a little bit of sound design and go ahead and get this instrument as close to how I sort of want it to sound when it's finished and when it's fully mixed as possible. And then once I've got it to a place like that, I'm gonna move on to the next thing. So then let's say the next thing that I wanna do is add a kick. So now I'm gonna add a kick. And again, I'm gonna go into my channel settings. I'm gonna turn the volume down. Now, generally I'd probably put this back on so that we're kind of hearing what the final level is going to sound like in our, in our track. And then we're gonna move on to the snare. And again, I'm gonna do the same thing. I'm gonna go to my channel settings. I'm gonna bring the volume down. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna try and balance all of these elements that I've got going on now and go ahead and try and make sure that they're at a pretty good volume and they kind of mix well together. Now again, with the kick, I'm gonna route it to a free mixer track. Same thing with the snare. I'm gonna go ahead and add any processing that I think is needed for it. Sometimes you have to go back later as the song progresses and maybe add a little bit of reverb on something or do some sort of other processing, some compression, whatever the case may be, because you're not quite far enough along to know exactly what it needs yet. But the idea is you wanna do as much to that individual sound as soon as you load it up and start working on it to get it to a place where it's finished. Now this is kind of a balancing act because while you're producing, you know, the creativity is flowing and you wanna get things done as quickly as possible so that you can stay in the same mindset of, of the original vision and goal of what your track is. So if you feel like you're getting stuck with any of these steps with processing something like that, just go ahead and move on. Don't let this process get in the way of your cre creativity. Just kind of keep it in mind and the more you practice it, the more it's gonna naturally kind of come to you. So once we're completely done with our project, we're feeling pretty good about it. It should already be well enough mixed that in two to three days, preferably longer if you have the time, 
when you come back to this session, you're ready to do an actual mixing session, you have very little to do. So at this stage, this is when you're doing your mixing session. The reason why I tell you you should wait a couple days is because you wanna give your ears a rest. You wanna get out of the state of creative mode, give your ears a rest, forget what it sounds like ideally, and then come back and listen to it on fresh ears. And then inevitably there's gonna be some things that kind of stick out to you. And then that's when you can go and quickly fix those things in the mix. And the less time you spend in this particular mixing session, the better, because as you continue to listen to the same things over and over again, your ears become fatigued and you start not really hearing things as accurately as you did when you first started the session. So if need be, you can split your mixing sessions up into multiple sessions. Once you're done with your mixing session, if you're planning on sending your track off for mastering or if you're planning on mastering your track in a separate session, you generally want your track to be peaking at around negative six decibels to around negative three decibels. It can be peaking lower than that if you want it to. The main thing is just that you wanna make sure that you're leaving enough headroom for you to work with in the mastering process. Thanks for watching the video, guys. If you liked it, be sure to hit the like button. If you're new to the channel, consider subscribing. Don't forget to hit the bell notification. That's gonna let you know anytime I release videos in the future. Right now I'm doing tutorials about once a week and those usually come out on Friday or Saturday. So keep an eye out for that. If you have any questions about anything or tutorial requests, feel free to hit me up on Instagram at anothermonster1. Also, if you feel like you're really struggling with music production, sound design, anything in between, and you feel like you just need a little bit of extra help, I am doing one one-on-one -on -one private lessons, which you can sign up for on my website at anothermonsterproductions.com. I'll be sure to leave a link in the description of this video if you guys want to sign up for that. And while you're there, be sure to take advantage of the free stuff I'm giving away in the description of this video as well. I've got a sample pack and an ebook, which you can download for free. You just need to enter your email address and I'll send that stuff over to you. And as always, I will see you in the next video.